I think we'll make a, a formal start and thank you for being so unexpectedly punctual. So my name is Liz Taylor. I'm a senior lecturer in urban planning design at Monash University. And on behalf of my colleagues, Carl Brodek, also of Monash, and Joe Hurley of RMIT University, I'd like to welcome you to the seminar on the past, present and future of planning for industry in London and Melbourne. To begin, I would like to acknowledge the people of the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands I live and work. I respectfully acknowledge their ancestors and elders. I extend that acknowledgement to the traditional custodians and their ancestors of the lands and waters across Australia. And in terms of today's topic, I reflect on how categories of land, water, industry and planning have all been deployed and often extractively and capriciously in the interests of global empire and economy. I suggest today we reflect critically on how our spatial tools have been inherited in often from this settler colonial project and are used on unceded lands, which have been occupied for far longer than the relatively recent urban history that we will be discussing today. So why look at urban manufacturing and industrial land and from a planning point of view? For many of us working in planning for the last few decades since the restructuring of the 1970s, we're accustomed to industry being something of a a secondary concern to housing and finance markets. Framed by deindustrialization and post-industrial narratives, industrial land has often been thought of in terms of redundancy and redevelopment opportunities. To the extent it has retained a role in planning discourse, it tends to be speculative and future-oriented, so advanced manufacturing and robots. <laughs> but the vulnerability of our global facing cities has recently been exposed during COVID-19. Relying on offshore everything is not so glibly done when supply chains stretch out from days to months. And we'll hear today about how for many small businesses, there's a renewed value placed on onshore manufacturing and supply chains. COVID-19 highlighted supply chain vulnerability, but also more broadly, the urgent need to address the lack of climate resilient industries and workforce inequalities in Australia. Zoning and planning that supports urban manufacturing may offer new opportunities to promote sustainable development that addresses these challenges. So we'll be talking today about the need for industrial areas, just starting from that basic premise, arguing that industrial land plays a critical part in the contemporary city, even if who and what that entails changes over time. And as a side note, my, my mind automatically goes to music with all topics. So Later, I'll have a pop quiz on your favorite song about a post-industrial city, partly because as industry changes and moves out, it's often occupied by uh, creative industries. We're also talking about the diversity of industrial areas in terms of their location, the size, sector, employees, and interactions they have with the planning system. While large-scale logistics operations, our Amazons and beyond, on the urban fringe are definitely part of the industrial landscape, they're not the full spectrum. Through our research, we explore the other miscellaneous yet persistent sides of industrial land that tend to be most overlooked. And we'll be speaking about planning, how to navigate conflict and change around industrial uses. While our answers are still under development, we suggest planning has a significant role to play in shaping, facilitating and inhibiting the landscape of industrial land and activity. So on our running order today, we've got three speakers focusing on two cities, London and Melbourne. First, we're going to hear from our guest, Jessica Firm from University College London, and I'll introduce Jessica shortly. We'll then have two shorter presentations. Joe and Carl will be speaking to historical and contemporary aspects of our joint ARC research project on industrial land planning. And we'll have quite a long period of time at the end, half an hour or more, where we'll value hearing your own insights. So hoping to have a bit of a discussion there and opening it up for future research opportunities as well. So I'd like to speak to our ARC project, Australian Research Council project. Um, both Joe and Carl will be presenting some excerpts. So it's just a sort of snapshot of our Monash RMIT discovery project, remaking post-industrial lands, urban industrial zoning, past and present. The project brings together historical perspectives on planning for industry with insights into the contemporary challenges of planning for urban manufacturing. One of the reasons we take a historical approach, apart from the fact that it's just interesting, is the availability of new techniques and data sources made possible by advances in GIS and basically digitized historical resources. Looking back over the 20th century, we're interested in charting the longer run influence and legacy of planning logics such as land use zoning. 
Zoning approaches emphasising land use separation and the suburbanisation of industry were shaped partly as a response to the deleterious effects of early industrialisation, but their longer term legacy is, is less understood. In today's seminar, Joe will focus on our work looking at the establishment of comprehensive zoning in Melbourne in the mid 20th century, the timeframes in which urban restructuring and the footprints of those policies were seen, and its legacies for planning in subsequent decades. Carl will be speaking to our ongoing contemporary work, drawing from an extensive program of interviews with a range of industrial businesses in Melbourne. We're interested in how existing and emerging urban industrial activities are shaped by the interactions with the planning system. So some of the questions we're asking, to what extent are our approaches to industrial land merely fitted in, in leftover or fringe spaces with potentially outdated mechanisms that might stifle innovation and change, even if they protect industrial areas? What are the planning policy setters, settings needed to best support industrial activity and growth in ways that support the city, provide equitable jobs and economic activity, work with other aspects of city life and work to support urban sustainability. So actually fitting industry into strategic planning rather than often being an aside. And at this point, I'd like to flag that the project is still underway and these questions, we're working through them and the next phase of our work is speaking with planning and related policy professionals like many of yourselves as well as welcoming your contribution to the discussion at the end of today. I'd like to extend an invitation to participate as an interview, interviewee in our research. There's a little informal sign up sheet there floating around or you can get in contact with Joe, Carl or myself for further information because we're really, at the moment, some of our research is a bit kind of perhaps skewed to the views of businesses. So if you're feeling a kind of like, no, 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 <laughs> participate in our research and get your perspectives across. So our first speaker is our guest, Jessica Firm, who is Associate Professor at the Bartlett School of Planning at University College London. And we're excited to have her here. I'd point you towards Jessica's publication record, which has been invaluable to us as a resource in research and in teaching. Jessica's primary area of current research activity explores the relationship between planning, development, and the ability of diverse and lower value economic activities to thrive in cities. So there's obvious paral parallels, but also differences between uh, London and Melbourne and a lot of planning legacy shared as well in this sort of sewerage history and zoning history. Um, I guess more to the point now, they're both large global cities which navigate the pressures of real estate markets and real estate speculation. Cities around the globe are now looking at ways to plan for industry by reintegrating production into denser mixed industry areas. However, many cities like London face severe shortages of industrial land after decades of rezoning for mixed-use development. They often lack the tools to address pressures from competing or conflicting uses. For Melbourne, London might offer opportunities to learn from a city that is to some extent ahead of the curve. So some of the pressures that Jessica is talking about, we haven't necessarily seen them here yet. There's new industries, new pressures and new planning approaches that Jessica will speak to. Uh, Jessica will now share her recent research on the changing industrial landscape and emerging pressures for tada, <laughs> hyper competitive industrial markets, <laughs> industrial land policy across London, focusing as well on the role of planners. Um, welcome, Jessica. Thank you so much for that introduction, Liz. Um, yeah, so I will cover a number of things uh, today in this presentation. Um, but I'm really happy to take questions on broader matters of um, planning in London, industrial land use planning in London in the conversation afterwards, because I can only obviously cover so much here. Um, so first of all, I will uh, look at just introduce you to London's industrial land use policy, not um, historic past, but recent past, and then the most recent changes in 2021 in the uh, latest London plan. Um, then look at uh, changing industrial markets, we'll look at um, the supply and demand picture, um, some of the drivers of growth and demand, um, the impacts of supply side shortages. Um, and I'll look at yeah what I refer to as the hyper competitive industrial market emerging and some of the impacts on that and what this means for planning. Um, yeah, so thinking about planning and drawing in some of the views that some of the insights I've gained through working with um, local authority planning and other 
sort of economic development and regeneration offices as well in London. So London industrial land use policy. Um, so since the first London plan, which was in 2004, there's been this policy of managed release of industrial land. So all the kind of 33 London local authorities have their own targets or had their own targets for the release of industrial land. Um, and here there was a, you know, a preoccupation in narratives of, of decline um, and, and, and how to manage it really. So sites like this in, in East London, Embarking and Dagenham, um, a lot of sites that had been largely vacant or underused um, have been reimagined as mixed use communities. I'm sure this is a really familiar uh, story to you, um, but problem with sites like this being low land values, um, viability of, of development is quite tough in these locations and very poor public transport. Um, so, you know, narrative of managed decline, but at the same time, an, an acknowledgement that um, London needed to protect the industrial land that it did have, and particularly the industrial land that was in areas of higher uh, land value and where pressures for redevelopment were higher. So we've had this sort of three parts uh, designation of industrial land, strategic industrial locations, which I think are equivalent to your state significant industrial precincts, I think, something like that, um, set by the Greater London Authority and the Mayor of London, um, envisaged to accommodate more strategic regional industrial functions. Um, the locally significant industrial sites, which are managed by local authorities, um, and then other industrial sites which have no protection whatsoever. And as you see, they make up quite a large proportion of the total industrial land in London. So strategic industrial locations, about 50%, locally significant ones, about 14% and other 36%. So these have been the most vulnerable. So as late as 2015, um, the industrial land demand projections looked something like this on the left. This was um, published by the GLA in 2016, looking at sort of looking at projections based on historic trends, essentially. And the projection was was a sort of continued downward trend. Um, at the same time, we were looking at projections of um, population growth in London um, and you can see why industrial land became a very attractive proposition for the accommodation of housing in this in this context. Um, but to accommodate this um, was quite quite challenging in, in the London context. So we have this uh, area of green belt, which is a sort of darker green around um, the edges, which is I'm sure you know was was there to prevent urban sprawl. Um, and protect green space. The lighter green mostly in the middle are conservation areas, so a lot of the historic parts of the city protected by conservation areas, um, leaving in a sense not a lot uh, of land left for um, redevelopment. But the uh, browny orange uh, blobs there are the swathes of strategic industrial land. Um, I don't know if you know the geography of London, but there, does this work? Um, this area here is um, sort of along the River Thames, the, the eastern part of the Thames Gateway. Um, and this is also a waterway running north here, the Upper Lee Valley, and this is around Heathrow. So these, these kind of agglomerations of strategic industrial land. Um, there is a system of um, identifying opportunity areas in London. So these are the areas that are envisaged for future growth. There are 48 opportunity areas across the city. And I'm now just going to overlay those on uh, this map. So they're the kind of lighter pinky orange um, there. So you can see, so I'm just going to go back. You can see that there's a significant overlap with the areas of strategic industrial land there. Um, so move on now. By the time we get to the London plan in 2021, um, industrial land demand projections had changed. 
Um, planners were now tasked with accommodating a positive net demand for industrial land over the next plan period. Um, but at the same time, housing capacity um, was still an issue and um, industrial sites were identified to accommodate and 40% of the housing capacity growth in London. So really difficult task for planners here in the London plan. So the part of the solution to this was to introduce a new uh, planning policy of intensification, co-location and substitution. Um, so three parts to this. One was intensifying industrial land for industrial. Uh, so multi-storey industrial buildings, the loss of yard space, so whereas previous we've had a lot of yard space here, less yard space in an intensified situation. Um, introduction of new residential on industrial land, keeping some light industrial within those mixed use typologies. Um, so co-location is co-location housing and industrial. Intensification tends to refer to intensification of industrial. And substitution is where as an acknowledgement that maybe industrial land is not all in the right place where the demand is and if we can find more suitable sites elsewhere and identify them um, we could lose some of the existing land that we have to housing. So the hope here I, I sort of interpret this as a, a desire for some kind of win-win where we can deliver both housing and industrial all on the same bits of land. Um, so this is quite new as a policy and obviously local authorities have been working with it. Um, question here you might have is so what happens to strategic industrial land? Does it still have the same kind of protection uh, that it did before? Um, so these are just some extracts from the London plan policy on strategic industrial land and we can see that local authorities are encouraged to both promote co-location and intensification on parts of sill, if they can produce a framework, if it's planned essentially, if it's not piecemeal loss. They are encouraged to essentially redraw boundaries of strategic industrial land so that what is left is intact, but other bits are maybe released. And they're also encouraged to think about substitution. So my interpretation of this is that there, is, there has been a softening of policy protection for strategic industrial land alongside an anyway rather weak framework for locally significant sites and those other sites. Um, so we're going to see obviously how this pans out in the future. Um, it seems that industrial sites are still seen as a reservoir for growth. The question is, you know, can we have our cake and eat it? Um, can we meet housing targets and accommodate industrial growth on this land? So now look at the changing industrial markets in London. Um, so first of all, on the sort of demand side here, we've seen a, a change in industrial employment. So we're now seeing growth in industrial employment. Um, so these are the years 2001 to 2006. 2006 to 2010 and you can see around the, the last London plans of 2015 it looked like there might something might be happening started to see a bit of an uptick in jobs um, didn't know if that was going to be a blip or not but it looks like that has that has that trend has consolidated across all the different um, sub regions of London so that looks like quite a, a significant trend now the, um, this is all from a most recent evidence-based study done, done for the GLA, by the way. Um, so this is looking at industrial land vacancy rates. Um, struck me here, I, I looked at your Melbourne plan and it looks as though your vacancy rates are significantly higher. Um, this, you know, we were at 16% in 2001. I mean, from my calculations, the Melbourne plan, it looks looks as though it might be hovering around the 25 percent that sounded very high to me um, but it'd be interesting to explore that interested to explore it later um, but as you see uh, we've seen a falling um, vacancy rate so it's now hovering now above the frictional level which is the level that's considered a sort of good for a healthy sort of churn of businesses on on, on these sites um, 
So suggesting there's a healthy demand and a growing demand. But the loss of industrial land supply continues. Um, so again, our figures are very much lower than Melbourne. I think you've got 26,000 or so hectares of industrial space. In 2001, we only had just over 8,000. Um, we've lost about 18% of that, so it's now uh, just below 7,000 hectares. So uh, that loss is way above what was planned. So in this managed decline, um, managed release scenario that I was describing earlier, um, targets were set and these targets were exceeded in most uh, parts of London. Um, you can see across London quite substantially. Um, so this picture of increasing demand and reducing supply in economics 101 um, has led to rising um, rental values for industrial across London quite significantly. So in 2022, we saw a 50% rise in rental values alone. Um, and that's been, as you can see, across the whole of London. Um, I want to just think about some of the key drivers of, of the growing demand that I've kind of gleaned from the literature. Um, so three drivers here that, that I've identified. Um, first is digitalization, and this has affected both the way that businesses operate, but also um, the way that consumers behave. Um, and this is a quite a familiar story, and we've seen the growth of um, e-commerce and logistics um, as a result. And there are some spatial implications of this. Um, in London, a lot of talk about sort of the last mile distribution centers being accommodated in the inner city, um, the emergence of dark kitchens, the, you know, during the pandemic, there was an explosion of these. I, I, I understand there's now less demand um, and, and warehousing. Then urbanization as a driver, uh, obviously with population growth, the rising demand for housing in urban centers, that creates that sort of parallel demand for um, industrial uses, ranging from logistics, waste management, construction, and everything else. Um, so th this is something which investors, I think, have now really cottoned onto um, and starting to see industrial as a very attractive investment proposition um, because of this continued uh, urbanisation. Um, and the next one is sort of geopolitics. I haven't even put pandemic on here, actually. Um, but in the UK, Brexit um, had a massive uh, impact uh, for us in terms of demand for warehousing suddenly increasing, um, an idea that we, we actually needed to be able to stop, keep things on our shores. Um, the war in Ukraine has also disrupted supply chains. Um, so increased demand for warehousing because of that. Um, also a greater push for domestic manufacturing, this sort of global geopolitics and the um, rivalry between the US and, and China um, has brought this to the top of the agenda in, in the UK as well. Um, so logistics uh, and warehousing, an obvious um, growth area, but there are some other growth areas, other occupiers in London that are really um, causing some change um, to the makeup of industrial land as well. So this is um, film and TV studios. London has become one of the most popular locations for um, film and TV studios. It's absolutely exploded in the last five years or so. Um, so this is uh, spending. So spend has you know, doubled in the last five years and it's projected to double again. Um, that's resulted in increased sort of planning applications for new film studios. Um, and London and the South East is, is the, the sort of major hotspot in, in the UK. Um, so we're looking at much bigger studios in the border South East and in London, uh, smaller ones. Um, but obviously local authorities see this as, as a good economic development opportunity. To, so this has sort of been somewhat embraced um, by local authorities, but we've yet to see really what, what the impact will be. 
This is uh, one that we went to look at under construction. It's just about to be finalised in North London on Enfield. Um, and Netflix has also uh, opened a studio very close to this. Um, full soundproofing, like really impressive. This was an old um, warehouse previously. Um, data centres are the other occupiers that are causing planners a bit of a headache. Um, so London again is uh, has been a focus for new data centres. Um, my understanding is that that's not necessarily because they need to be in London, but they're they're um, gathering around the M4, the motorway corridor that leads out of London towards the Atlantic, and it's the sort of fibre op optic cables that. Um, provide that infrastructure for them. So parts of West London that are on this corridor have seen uh, a big growth. Um, this is somebody online who documented um, all the data centres in London in 2016, and there have been many, many more since then. But you can see that this is, you know, that there are clusters, but that this is happening all across London as well. Um, so planners that I've spoken to um, I've talked about, you know, how this is quite difficult to manage because planning applications come in for something that looks like uh, a multi-storey industrial building. Um, and it's only much later that um, they realise perhaps that it's that it's a data centre. Um, so negotiations on design are quite difficult to have at that pre-application stage if they don't know what they're dealing with. Um, and in terms of, you know, whether they are uses that should be on bits of industrial land, you know, all these questions that planners are still grappling with. Um, so quite early days, but something to watch. What am I doing for time? Okay. Um, so the supply side shrinkage um, that we've seen. So the shortage of supplies fuels rental growth, as we can see in the context of enhanced demand. Um, so this is increasing competition and attracting investment into the industrial sector. I showed you the quantum loss of industrial land that we've seen in London. Um, but from other things I've read and from speaking to people, um, the, the real loss of supply is greater than that. Um, partly because supply is not always in the right place. Um, the age of a lot of the industrial stock in London is old. Um, and it's uh, not meeting the new energy efficiency standards, which means that a lot of the old stock will not be lettable, won't come, won't be able to come to the market. Um, there was a construction boom uh, a few years ago, in a sense, in response to this, um, but that has now slowed. Um, my understanding is that this is this is to do with build costs, which have rocketed as a result of the Ukraine war. So we're not able to now build quickly enough to meet the demand that is there. So some implications for planning. Um, so the greater investor interest in industrial means that um, many sites are now flipping um, from residential to industrial. Industrial uh, is easier to deliver than a lot of these complex mixed use developments. Um, as I said, it's now seen as a rather safe investment um, opportunity. So in 2022, Savills estimated that 9% of the total residential pipeline coming forward in London could be at risk of becoming industrial with a potential loss of 130,000 residential units. So there's always this sort of balancing act going on in London between the residential and the industrial. Um, and this would have quite a significant impact on delivery of housing targets. Uh, so I looked at a couple of case studies of where this is happening um, in real time. Um, so a couple of opportunity areas. Remember I said that there were 48 opportunity areas in London. Um, so one of those is in West London, a place called Southall, which is where there's a high concentration of South Asian and the South Asian community. Um, it's close to Heathrow, so historically uh, was a place where there was lots of industry. 
Um, but it's also the location of the new east-west uh, Elizabeth Line, which is sort of high-speed rail linking east and west London. So this was seen as a perfect location for uh, intensification of, of housing and, and in use, reimagined as a new mixed-use community with a lot of high-density development. Um, site number six here was identified as uh, uh, mixed use, sort of emerging master plans at the time of the publication of this framework, which was, I think, in 2014. Um, a planning application was submitted for one of those sites. It was a um, factory of cereal, honey monster factory, uh, sort of sugar puff type cereal. Um, and this site came forward and was was reimagined as a mixed use site, quite sort of high density. Planning application went in, which was approved. Um, nothing happened. Um, and then the next thing Ealing Council knew um, was that it was flipped. It was going to be transformed now into one of London's largest logistics developments. Um, and this is now what the new uh, application looks like. So uh, back to sort of single story low density um, sheds on this site. Um, much less high risk um, and values are so high now that that's really attractive proposition. So the question is, I can't tell you, I can't give you an answer to this, but the question is, you know, how how common is this now across London? How much is this happening? We don't know. Um, however, looking at one of the other opportunity areas, um, I got some anecdotal evidence uh, that British land had purchased two sites here, which had also been given uh, planning permission for residential. And they are now, there is a consultation with the local community on these um, sites for last mile log logistics. So two hubs within sort of close proximity to each other coming forward for logistics on those sites. Now, um, locally, this is seen as quite a good thing in that it's a sort of way of protecting the industrial land so that, you know, local businesses were really concerned that the opportunity area was going to lead to decimation really of industrial land in this area and a lot of local businesses having to move. Um, so in a sense, this has slowed that process down. Um, but lots of interesting questions that emerge from this. Um, so I'm now just going to end with some views from local authority officers working in uh, the various local authorities across London. Um, some of them are planning officers, some are economic development regeneration officers, but all have come together under this um, network, the Industrious London Officer Network, really sort of, you know, it's like a geek network for people interested in industrial land. And that was all of us going on a site visit to Barking and Zagnum recently. Um, so it's a kind of forum for sharing ideas and practice. Um, so some insights gleaned from my participation in that and attending those meetings over the last year or so. Um, so thinking about that London plan policy, um, co-location intensification, uh, how is it being perceived on the ground? Um, so first of all, a concern that in order to be compatible with residential, um, the space that's coming forward, um, is it really real industrial space? Is it really designed to accommodate um, industrial users or is it uh, likely to come forward as space for creative industries or others or local Tesco Metro? <laughs> <laughs> um, so a, a worry that this this might not deliver real industrial space. And then also a concern that, you know, once you introduce housing into the mix, it creates a permanence um, and could undermine the need for flexibility on industrial land to, to respond to future trends. So we can see, you know, we don't really know where things are go, going to go in the future. We don't know what sort of space we're necessarily going to need. Um, so a concern that, that there's a compromise um, going on that, that could, could be problematic. So the next concern is, is around sort of loss of workspace diversity. Um, 
acknowledging that it's becoming difficult to protect the diversity that is there already. Um, so the tools that planners have had are kind of weakened or have weakened over time. Um, but very difficult to recreate the kind of diversity we see across uh, industrial sites in new development. Um, so, you know, how do we make sure that we can really, you know, we can create spaces in the future that all different types of businesses can use? Uh, real concern. A lot of discussion as well around the sites that are available and are they um, suitable for meeting the demand that's out there? Um, so site availability is a huge issue. Um, so local authorities know that there's a lot of demand for X, Y and Z, but um, they can't always find the sites uh, to accommodate that. Um, existing industrial sites are, are in demand uh, for housing often. Securing new sites for industrial where demand is, is difficult. I'm sure it's the same in Melbourne. You know, if you don't protect what is there, it's very difficult to establish new uh, industrial land. It's never the most, uh, it's never the land use that's most um, popular locally. Um, there's an issue of fragmented land ownership, um, long leaseholds, lots of small plots. Uh, so when Developers come in um, and they want to develop a site for logistics, say. Um, it, it's difficult to local authorities are struggling really to, to get sites, amalgamate sites for that. That could be a good, you know, that, that could be a blessing in disguise for, for some of these smaller uh, occupiers and manufacturers. Um, but this is what we're hearing from officers. Uh, the next challenge is around delivery um, and obviously local authorities don't really have a lot of control over delivery. Um, there are issues of viability on sites. Um, so although you know, we, can, we can identify a site as being suitable for uh, industrial, for mixed use with industrial, bringing that forward is another matter. Um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of developer appetite for this at the moment. Still, developers are um, going for more traditional typologies. Um, so that's a kind of mental barrier. Um, developers are obviously dealing with often risk averse occupiers and risk averse uh, investors. So the viability is an issue. Um, the market isn't on its own, doesn't seem to be really delivering what uh, the London plan wants. Um, this uh, site in development in Barking and Dagenham, which is uh, branded Industria, um, is actually being brought forward by an arm's length regeneration company that is uh, owned or partly owned by the council. Um, so this is a kind of demonstration project uh, to show, in a sense to show to the market what can be done. Um, but this is almost complete. Um, but there are very few local authorities in a position to be able to do something like this. So there's a real question of, you know, who's going to bring this forward if the market is not doing it? Um, the other concern around delivery is design. So some of these planning officers are, you know, working on the urban design side, trying to get high quality design into their boroughs. And I think often the the mixed use schemes that were coming forward through opportunity areas were seen as a way to achieve good placemaking um, in those boroughs. And, you know, working with industrial developers uh, is much more difficult in terms of achieving good design. Um, less of a consensus as to what good design kind of means when it comes to industrial and often um, very practical concerns that are driving industrial developers like around security and access and management and things like that, not really about connectivity and other softer design features. And finally, um, concern that there's a lack of industrial vision really. Um, this was a publication by, um, you know, Vienna, where various European cities are thinking 
in a quite visionary way about their cities and the productive uh, focus of their cities in the future. Um, this, this isn't really there in London. Um, London talks very much about the quantum of industrial land. Um, doesn't really talk about where things should go, why they should go in certain places, um, how we can deliver it, and really what sort of future we want for the city. Um, so those conversations not really being had, um, either at the London or the local authority level. Some suburban boroughs are talking about the fact that we need a better balance, that we can't just bring forward these sort of dormitory suburbs. We need to have a balance between employment and residential. So those conversations are being had, but they're not really translating into anything very substantial at the moment. Um, however, the officers working on this are all very aware that there's a lot of opportunity to integrate this into the climate change sustainability agenda. Um, there are people thinking about how to integrate industrial into the sort of 20, 15, 20 minute neighbourhoods. Um, an understanding that we need to think carefully about infrastructure planning, um, transport and utilities, if, if this is going to kind of work in the future. So there's kind of scope for a need for a lot of visioning, but it's not really currently happening. Um, part of the problem, I think, is that there's a political dimension to planning, of course, and although there's this bunch of very committed, excited uh, officers working in this area, uh, politicians are, are much less up to speed currently. So um, in conclusion, I talked about this sort of emerging hyper competitive industrial market with strong rental growth. Um, which seems to be slowing the process of industrial displacement by residential led uh, redevelopment or gentrification, which was the dominant story before. Um, but there are new competitive dynamics within the industrial market emerging. Um, and I would refer to this perhaps as a sort of narrowing of demand. So we're seeing sort of demand really being dominated by you know, logistics, the film studios I talked about, data centers and others um, and other other uses not getting so much of a look in. Um, so there's a real question now around what does this mean for uh, urban manufacturing and other smaller scale industrial occupiers and what, what is their future um, in a city like London, where, as you can see, it's such a constrained um, supply side situation. Um, and what is their future going to be? Uh, so a concern about diversity of workspaces coming forward, but also challenges for housing delivery in this context. Um, the planning system is struggling to respond. So we have these sort of we don't really talk about zoning so much, um, but we talk about you know planning policies and um, policies there to protect bits of land. Um, but they're really there. What you know, the strategic industrial land designation is there to protect from residential, um, but not really looking within the industrial market itself. So we don't really have the tools available to do much about it at the moment, um, even if we wanted to. So we have a market, you know, very market driven planning system, um, which I know you do here too, um, and a drive towards deregulation planning, which is essentially meaning that, um, you know, the move is to make it much easier to move in between all these commercial categories rather than harder. Uh, so we're not looking at a situation in the future where there's any appetite at all for breaking these categories down. Um, the appetite is really to sort of open it all up and allow, allow more of a free for all um, when it comes to putting in planning applications. Um, so questions uh, later, we can talk about maybe implications of all this for Melbourne um, and elsewhere. Um, and otherwise, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. And as Jessica mentioned, we're going to hold questions to the end. Um, that's my note. Um, and Jessica said they don't talk about zoning in London, but of course, Joe is about to talk about lots of zoning, so you'll get your fill there. But I think there's a lot of interesting overlaps about the kind of nuance of planning tools and within in the industry and how you kind of respond to these unexpected sort of turns um, and the 
the kind of diversity question, the how and what it looks like and those kinds of questions underneath just simply thinking about land use categories, I think is something we do share and will be part of our uh, discussion. So I'm going to hand over to Joe Hurley of RMIT, who's going to be speaking, as mentioned, to part of our ARC project shared between Monash and RMIT on uh, remaking industrial plans in Melbourne. And this is the historical part of the project, only part of. Over to you, Joe. Thank you very much, Liz, and thanks, Jessica, for that lovely presentation. Uh, lots to chew over there in discussion, I hope. So this is a bit of a kind of a, a sojourn into the past now, um, drawing from the historical work, as Liz mentioned, as part of our ARC, uh, but still with these broader questions of the relationship between land use policy uh, and industrial activity. Uh, but as Liz said, we do do zoning here, and this is very much focused on I uh, guess the institutionalization of zoning in Melbourne uh, through the 1954 planning scheme and what happens uh, in the decades after to industrial land use. So the fundamental question really driving this work is the extent to which zoning influences uh, spatial dynamics of industrial activity in cities. And we're looking at trying to chart that over longer time periods to really get deeper into that question of that relationship over time. And depending on your background, um, there might be many policy professionals in here, I'm not sure, maybe some econo economists. Uh, we might think there's an obvious answer to that question. Policy always drives good outcomes on the ground. That's what we do. We do good policy, we get outcomes on the ground. Well, when we look at kind of research on industrial uh, dynamics in cities uh, internationally uh, and economic geography, planning and planning policy is largely kind of sidelined as a significant influence on the decisions and the locational decisions in particular of industry, looking more at labour markets, land markets, as Jessica was talking about, uh, infrastructure, agglomerate, agglomeration economies. But we're interested in, I guess, delving a little deeper into this question of the role of policy and spatial policy in influencing industrial activity over time. So the case study is Melbourne. Uh, so for everyone in the room, we should be fairly familiar with that. Uh, most people online probably fairly familiar as well. We might have people coming uh, to us who are less familiar. Uh, we're looking at this period, as I mentioned, um, starting with the introduction of comprehensive zoning in Melbourne with the 1954 planning scheme. That's not to say that there isn't proto-zoning activity before this, but this is a really important period in Melbourne's history with comprehensive um, standardised zoning across the metropolitan landscape, and we're interested then in examining uh, what kind of implications that has for industrial activity in the decades that follow. So Melbourne as a case study really, I think, typifies the kind of um, uh, policy norms that are, are, are really entrenching through the mid 20th century in Australia. Uh, they're drawing from a range of influences in the United Kingdom, in Europe, but increasingly from America. The planning scheme, you know, that many of you might be very familiar with, uh, can be certainly seen as a comprehensive strategic document based on really comprehensive uh, research, engagement with issues. But as an implementation mechanism, the central piece is very much land use zoning, comprehensive zoning for the metropolitan region and the ordin ordinances that prescribe the uses across all the zones in the metropolitan area. So this approach really draws from the US kind of logics that are growing through the early and mid 20th century with a, a kind of all in focus on land use and land use zoning as the mechanism of trying to control uh, conflicts and deliver on some of the other strategic needs of the broader metropolitan landscape uh, and less so on Europe and, and Britain, uh, as we've heard from Jessica, where zoning was less prevalent in the UK and in continental Europe, more focus on uh, zoning form rather than just zoning use as a mechanism for delivering on strate strategic objectives. Use certainly part of the mix, but use uh, separation uh, by exception, if you like, rather than as the rule. So what we see then, I guess, being uh, embedded in Australian context here, and certainly in the Melbourne uh, context of this period, is this full commitment to land use zoning uh, and which necessarily kind of follows to the separation of uses, the demixing of uses uh, through the 20th century and particularly with respect to industrial land uses. So very much following the American path in that sense. The European and, and, and kind of UK influences are still very much there in that strategic planning context for the land use zoning. 
uh, something that's less evident in the United States through this period, but the mechanisms of land use zoning certainly driving um, the implementation of those strategic directions on the ground. Okay, this image here, I've had a couple of images from the 54 plan just to kind of really uh, hit home that influence, that growing influence of the US um, logics here. I, you won't be able to read the caption, but I've got it written here on my notes. Contemporary factory design, which demands space, not attainable in central locations. So the logic here uh, in this and in, in much of this, this document is around large areas, urban fringe, separated from other urban activities. And I guess in our work, the broader work of the program, um, reaching into contemporary periods as well, we would suggest that many of these planning logics are still in large part baked into the way we think about industrial land use planning uh, in our contemporary cities today. So the approach then is where, we're, as Liz mentioned in the outset, we're wanting to make use of, um, you know, uh, improving approaches to digitization of historical records for historical analysis. Uh, and answering interesting questions. I and mean, I hope you think they're interesting as well. We're bringing together data from a range of different so sources. So it's the plan itself uh, and the related ordinances, um, which uh, we've been doing content analysis on to help with that digitization process of the, of the planning zoning maps um, across metropolitan Melbourne. So we've hand digitized. It's not a very sophisticated sounding uh, technical <laughs> approach there, uh, but we've hand drawn, um, we looked at, at, at kind of, um, image recognition approaches, but it was a bit beyond us at the time. And probably that was a, a year ago. Probably now we could just point chat GPT at it or something and we'll fix it for us. Anyway, we hand drew the polygons for the industrial zones um, in the 1954 scheme and the major revision in 1968 based on our content analysis of the underlying ordinances. Ultimately, that is for this analysis simplified to kind of lands targeted for industrial use commercial use and residential, but there's nuances in underneath that from the ordinances um, that we've uh, captured. And then we're bringing that together uh, with historical business activity um, drawn from the Sands and McDougall business directories, which were very helpfully digitized by EPA Victoria. Um, and that provides a, a longitudinal data set of firm listings. And we're drawing on three years, uh, 1955, to correspond um, fairly closely with the, um, the introduction of zoning, a decade later in 1965, and then almost a decade later in 1974, which is in fact the last year of those records. So we've got three time points, uh, spatial information in terms of the zones and spatial information in terms of the business listings. Kind of represented here as a screenshot one day uh, when um, Declan was showing us um, particular characteristics here of the uh, uh, clothing and footwear industry. It's so the the, doint, the sorry the points here are businesses, not all businesses. This is clothing clothing and footwear. You can see that concentration in the CBD area through the study period. Uh, the polygons are the industrial areas here shown. I think is the 68 um, version of industrial areas, um, which is both industrial zones and a number of other zones that allowed significant industrial use through the time. This map is kind of really for me to make a couple of points to. You won't be able to see the detail of. Uh, it's from a publication that we've got coming out, hopefully very shortly in review, um, communicating much of this work. But really it's to show a couple of things, the distribution, the scattered distribution of industrial zones throughout the metropolitan landscape, uh, both in the 1954 plan uh, and the updated release in 1968. Um, the laser pointer comes out of that end, does it? That end? That end. Which part is the way? Other way. That way. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> uh, large releases uh, during the midpoint of our study period, um, sort of showing that suburbanisation of industry um, uh, in the 1968 revision. But alongside that, maintenance of industrial land through the inner urban landscape through these boom years, this post-war boom period, with rezoning of industrial land away to other uses. So we're seeing that pressure already come in through this period, but also uh, rezoning to industrial land in some areas. So from a zoning point of view, uh, despite the broader narratives of suburbanization, the plan, there's still a maintenance of, of um, industrial land uh, through this period. Okay, so now I'd like to talk um, to some of the results uh, from this analysis. So these are the kind of two headline charts that capture this relationship between 
the business firm locations um, and the zoning um, provisions over time to really explore, I guess, the extent to which use is conforming to zone over time. And that's and that's what we're interested in. So the chart on the left is all industrial firms. I'm using the wrong button again. Uh, all industrial firms um, across the three study periods. And the first thing to highlight is this increase in the proportion of industrial firms locating in industrially zoned land across this period. So, you know, as kind of good policy makers, like, yes, the policy is doing something, we hope, or at least uh, it's following the businesses at the very least. Significant increase in industrial businesses, and industrial land, and then alongside that, we've got a significant increase in the proportion of industrial firms in the residential areas where they are non-conforming uses through this period. Uh, one thing to note is the lag that we observe um, in that move away from, essentially a move away from residential land uh, that we see here um, in, in the move from industrial, uh, industrial premises from residential land, which comes up a time and a time again in the data. Um, then when we look on the right, we see um, by comparison the non-industrial firms, and this is a way, I guess, to isolate whether or not this is just a broader move across the economy um, or whether this is a phenomenon, phenomenon, phenomenon <laughs> sorry, uh, of uh, industrial activity. And when we look at other firms in industrial zones, we don't see this rise. So it confirms that, you know, this really is uh, a phenom phenomenon that we're seeing in industrial land with industrial businesses. Again, we see um, this switch between commercial land uses, moving more to commercially zoned land and away from residential. But again, this kind of delay in this um, across the two decades that we're looking at this material. So I guess together in combination, they the results here confirm a significant conformance over time of industrial activity to industrial zone. But they also suggest that the zoning mechanism uh, is acting as a fairly weak push mechanism in terms of moving non-conforming uses out of residential areas. And this is certainly tied up with um, the existing use rights that were um, presented through the 1954 scheme and continue to be a significant part of planning uh, and zoning regulation today. Another question we're interested in is this question of uh, suburbanization and deindustrialization. Uh, in inner urban areas uh, in these post-war uh, boom decades, the extent to which this conformance of industry to industry zone is really tied up in a movement of industry to the outer, sorry, to the outer areas of the city. So we've got two charts here that split up um, the geography of the city into inner areas and outer areas. So firstly, on uh, the left here, we've got the outer areas. Again, this conformance to zone over time. Uh, that's noted, but if I've got the absolute numbers down the bottom here. We can see the significant growth in overall industrial businesses through this period in the outer areas of the city at the time, uh, and indeed the, the significant growth in industrial zoned land. So we are certainly seeing significant suburbanisation of industry, growth of, of industry in the suburban areas across this period. What's interesting, however, is when we look at the inner area, um, we don't see the kind of narrative of deindustrialization and decline playing out in the data in this two decade period in the kind of the post-war boom. Uh, the data does end in mid 1970s and we're trying to gather other data sources to look beyond this, but certainly the kind of accepted norms even through this period is there's a the beginnings of significant deindustrialization. The numbers of industrial businesses stays relatively consistent through this time in absolute terms. But within that, we see a significant concentration into the industrial, industrially zoned areas and a move out of the residential areas as well. So it's not just a kind of static environment here. There is a churn of businesses relocating, closing down, opening up. That suggests a very vibrant um, industrial economy um, in the inner areas through the two decades of the study period. So in combination, again, the results Yes, they show this suburbanisation of industry, but not a kind of corresponding deindustrialization of the inner urban area, but rather a persistence of that over time. 
So I'll wrap up with a few kind of concluding comments before handing over to Carl, who's going to bring us back into the contemporary setting. First to note that, uh, you know, we've got a historical data set that we think is really interesting here, leveraging off the work of EPA Victoria uh, and bringing the digitised zoning information to this. Uh, there's a lot of interesting questions that we could point this at, and we're certainly interested in conversations about that with anyone in the room, uh, if, if you're interested or see research potential. In terms of the results, the kind of key things I want to highlight is that we're definitely seeing in our analysis significant conformance to the zoning mechanisms that are introduced comprehensively in 1954 over this two decade period, and particularly with industrial land across this period. They reveal and confirm that kind of narrative of um, suburbanisation, dramatic suburbanisation growth, growth of industry in the suburbs, and within that growth largely in industrially zoned land but also the persistence of industrial activity and a, and a persistent um, you know, dynamism in industrial activity within inner urban areas, which is kind of counter to elements of the dominant narrative of suburbanisation and deindustrialization. At the very least, it unsettles that narrative um, to some useful extent, I think. So the case study reveals that zoning certainly matters in the context of the spatial dynamics of industrial uh, activity in cities. But also that when we're trying to understand the kind of more complex points of those dynamics, longer time frames of our analysis is really important to see how zoning plays out over time in terms of industrial activity. And we've certainly seen in this the considerable lag effect with um, the push of industry, industry away from non-conforming uses as the kind of slow and accumulating effort, I guess, sorry, reality, I suppose, of industries coming up against the planning system when they're wanting to change, grow or move uh, is when really the, the push factor of that planning mechanism is able to exert its influence. So to segue to the contemporary work, um, and I guess to riff off um, many of Jessica's points, um, questions about whether the policy settings we have today are working effectively to, to support and to understand that dynamic of industrial activity in our cities, whether we're working to um, support innovation, to support new business development, uh, while also protecting the common goods of the city, or are we being constrained by kind of entrenched norms of use separation, of decentralisation, and notions of the inevitability of industrial decline, which as Jessica pointed out, are you know only a few years put in the bin in London, and I still think they're hanging around in many of the narratives around industry in the city here in Melbourne. Over to you, Carl. Right. Thanks, Joe. Um, well, thanks everybody for coming out on a wet day. Good to see. Um, old friends, some new faces here. I'm going to talk about some work we've been doing that um, is wrapping up uh, for a special issue of the journal Urban Planning um, that is looking at sustainable manufacturing. And um, so the focus of the talk is looking at how planning regulations um, might influence that potential for sustainability and manufacturing operations. And I think from a planning perspective, it's important to talk about this. We spent a lot of time thinking about residential environments, um, about active and multimodal transportation. When we think of sustainability, we don't think too much about sustainable production lands. So we want to add that to the conversation. And there's a lot you could do here. One, you know, things I'm not going to get into is industrial sprawl. That's something I could talk about, um, as well as some uh, of the focus on innovative um, technology for manufacturing production for um, net zero emissions. And for example, I'm not going to get into that. This is more about the the relationship between the regulatory environment and manufacturers. Um, and in the process, we'll get at one of the big themes of the work that we've been doing is the challenges um, around planning and zoning for what is a very diverse set of urban manufacturers, often small manufacturers. Um, and, and I'll be doing this through interview um, outcomes with food and beverage manufacturers in Melbourne. And all of this work, as well as some other um, research we've been doing that I'm not talking about today, is going to feed forward um, to inform the final stage of the ARC project, which is talking to planners 
talking to policymakers about their views, their perspectives on on the relationship between manufacturing and industrial land, um, and and take it forward. And today, what I'm talking is very much a firm centric um, approach, and I'm not ashamed to say that. I think we can learn a lot here um, from that situation. As a starting point, I think industrial lands, in terms of this kind of sustainable urban planning um, discussion that's going on for decades, industrial lands tends to be left out of that that picture. Um, what Joe was talking about and not establish logic around use separation and amenity impact is I think largely today how we continue to plan around industrial lands. Um, the sort of narratives and visions have tended towards advanced manufacturing increasingly that kind of shifts that larger kind of strategic policy framework. But when um, we're actually talking about planning on the ground, we're still people have I mean, I think often a very traditional view of industrial land. It's large lot outer suburban space for logistics and warehouse uh, activity need good transport access. Um, and these are you know, typically low employment density, low cost, um, high impact um, firms. But, there, but there's so much more out there um, to consider. When we have looked at industrial lands as part of a sustainable planning um, agenda, it's usually as a source of redevelopment. So we look at industrial lands as an opportunity for rezoning towards transit oriented mixed use development, which certainly brings uh, important benefits to cities, but at the same time it has some drawbacks. It, it often engenders speculative development. Research shows it's associated with declining affordability as pre-existing residents and businesses are displaced from these areas. And that in turn reduces um, the often rich land use and employment mix that exists on industrial lands. And for my purposes today, like the big question here around industrial rezoning is, is that it harms many of the small specialized manufacturers that actually need to be in cities because of their functional requirements. So this is this could be, you know, small biotech, some other kind of um, advanced um, manufacturing operation that use digital production techniques, could be a very um, hands on craft manufacturing, it could be essential services and support um, that, that are needed um, to just make a city function ranging from food production that I'll talk about to um, recycling waste remediation. Um, certain types of manufacturing industrial activity have to be in cities and that's why they're here and it's important to have the right land in the right sort of place like Jessica was alluding to. Um, and we know a lot about why especially like high tech and small craft manufacturing activities. We know why they locate and why they cluster. We know about agglomeration economies, um, but we haven't really looked at how those features might translate into sustainable development outcomes or sustainable production. Um, I've, I've done recent work a couple of years ago that looked at comparing industrial zones to other targeted uh, employment areas in Melbourne, and we were able to show just through descriptive statistics the association with quality employment with a really diverse range of industries and occupations. Uh, and this is really important when you think about economic resilience, because if most cities like Melbourne are based around a very high wage, high skill and low wage, low skill service economy, industrial lands support those businesses that are filling in the middle and, and help speak to that resilience. There's also opportunity to think about the way manufacturing is changing, the type of manufacturing that actually can and does still exist in a lot of cities. Um, it's smaller, it's cleaner. They um, you know, tend to use smaller building space. Um, they rely on local supply chains frequently. They draw on local markets. So this has the potential to reduce carbon footprints and you can think about an alternative way of thinking about import substitution uh, as well. There's also potential for, for localized resource and waste flows. So sharing of resources, recycling of materials and particularly food and beverage with with food waste uh, as well. So these are the kind of potential things we could consider um, that come out of classic agglomeration economies. Uh, and a handful of cities are thinking through this. They're thinking about new spaces of production. Um, places have tightened up their industrial zoning regulations, basically with the idea that they can protect land to keep out competing and conflicting uses. So you could potentially have a more sustainable manufacturing operation look through that agglomeration of activity. Others are taking a, a different tack and looking at 
more flexible zoning regime. So targeting specific areas where there's a high um, level of discretion in terms of lot size, building heights, shared spaces, um, the ability to bring in higher retail or office ratios into a building, vertical manufacturing buildings like 150 Hooper. These are all intended to support a key aspect of the changing nature of urban manufacturing around so-called manufacturing servitization. So that means you don't just have a traditional manufacturing plant, but there's there's also some sort of service activity on site. There's a design component potentially as well. Um, in our case with food and beverage, uh, a lot of firms will have some kind of retail or consumption component on site that's part of their business model. Finally, um, there's the potential to adapt industrial symbiosis strategies, thinking through shared infrastructure and, and um, around waste and other, other activities. Um, the problem with a lot of these is a lot of it looks really good on paper, but it doesn't always address key challenges. Um, one is around amenity impact. So even small manufacturers are going to have some kind of impact around noise, smell, traffic, and so forth that needs to be addressed. Uh, and secondly, the real estate dynamics of conflicting uses. Um, there's, you know, you introduce higher paying uses, office and residential into an area that's going to bid up the potential value of real estate. It makes it hard for lower rent manufacturing operations to stay put. At the same time, you have inner industry gentrification is something that Jessica was was getting into um, as well, where you know you have a case of a brewery or some kind of um, advanced manufacturing operation that can pay more for land is going to raise that land value um, and and displace other producers. So we wanted to get at these questions, look at that relationship between zoning and um, manufacturing, their potential for sustainability. Um, so we had 31 interviews with a wide range of food and beverage manufacturers here in Melbourne. Um, they varied in terms of year of establishment, the number of employees, their markets, their business models. So about half of them had this hybrid production um, service based model. Um, and, and I would say largely like the voices that you're going to hear me talking about briefly are probably more balanced to the very small end and the, the hybrid production um, side. Um, simply because they're the ones who are really facing a lot of challenges with the planning system. And, it's, and I think it's interesting to think, think through this. Um, we asked them about their location decisions, their supply chains, their skill sets, um, the markets they serve. And we looked at firms across each of the industrial zone types and commercial and special use zones as well. Um, so kind of, I guess, a sort of indirect finding or confirmatory finding that's important to think about up front is the context for zoning. So there is no like one size fits all industrial zone. There's uh, a, a really interesting diversity even in Melbourne of industrial zone areas and kind of context, context that firms want to be in. So you have a kind of more traditional low density um, middle or outer suburban uh, industrial zone. We have some firms we spoke with they are in transitioning areas. So these are former industrial areas zoned now for commercial, um, yet they still function as industrial zones. Um, some of them are quite central, like in this example here. I guess I can use the pointer. That's a CBD right there. Um, and really a lot of firms, especially these hybrid manufacturing firms, gravitated to what we call pocket industrial areas. So <clears throat> these are kind of like the remnants left over of the rezoning of the last 20, 30 years uh, in, in throughout Melbourne. And so you have um, industrial areas that are adjacent to residential or commercial areas that essentially gives them a built in market. So you can, you know, a newer six story um, residential next to a brewery here. Um, and so that they they like these areas because they have a built in market and they also get afforded the protection that comes with an industrial zone um, uh, of being there. And in some cases, these older zones have been around a long time for various reasons. Um, the zones themselves has a have a huge mix of land uses and business types as well. So just reviewing some of the kind of potential sustainability outcomes, you know, based on some of those contextual features, um, food and beverage manufacturers really have a high propensity to cluster 
many of our interviewees were on, uh, you know, the inner 8K of Melbourne, although we, we did speak to some further out. Um, and, you know, just that density of activity really helps speak to a number of potential sustainability outcomes in terms of using smaller building footprints. There's reduced travel both for the workforce and for um, the uh, supply chains as well. Uh, and a lot of this tends to be built around delivering to local consumption, albeit very high end consumption. And I guess that's maybe something to think about with a lot of the sustainable manufacturing we talk about is it is, you know, does have its own um, downside as well as it's not this democratic sustainability, if you want. Um, contrary to a lot of the craft manufacturing literature, there's there's not like a, a, a lot of direct collaboration and networking within specific industrial districts among our interviewees. The one instance where we really saw this was in a, a fairly new industrial zone that's been marketed as a food uh, manufacturing hub. Um, but by and large, most of these firms are connecting at a metropolitan level um, in terms of particularly their their supply chains. Um, and so, you know, breweries, uh, virtually all the ones we spoke to use Victorian ingredients. They use local packaging um, suppliers. Th that ranges to a, a pasta maker that would import its flour but use local packaging because they need to have quick customized um, packages for different customers. Distilleries use local botanicals and fruit byproducts that come from throughout Victoria in their in their products. Um, so it's it's kind of this range of mix, but a lot of it is very much based on um, localized supply chains, and part of it comes from a sustainability ethos from the firms, but also a branding exercise as well. As I said, this is a lot of this is tapping into to higher end markets. And then thirdly, food and beverage manufacturers process a lot of organic waste and they use a lot of energy. Uh, and so a lot of the firms, I mean, virtually all the firms that are dealing with food waste are trying to compost this or they give this to Victorian farmers for feed and fertilizer. Um, they recycle packaging. At the same time, coffee roasters go through tons and tons of coffee. Cafes go through tons and tons of, of coffee beans. A lot of it goes moldy before it can be composted. And so we had one firm that was trying to think through some innovative ways of repurposing coffee grounds, for example. Um, there's also a high level of energy consumption, as I said, from bakeries and, and kitchens, um, prepared meals to uh, breweries. Um, and a lot of the buildings that are in urban areas are dealing with older utilities that they run into problems with. Some, about six of the 30, have been able to install solar panels, which has helped reduce their energy usage and, and cost. Um, but a lot of firms face challenges around upgrading very expensive uh, utilities for older buildings. Uh, or they have asbestos in the roof. They can't um, retrofit it, and so they're they're sort of stuck. Some of these firms are looking to outer suburban locations. The problem there is the space is too big for their needs, or it doesn't have appropriate utilities because a lot of the outer suburban industrial land is built for warehousing, which doesn't have the same kind of utility needs as as food and beverage manufacturers. So turning to the question of how the planning system might enable support sustainable outcomes here. Um, I guess the first basic takeaway is that industrial land indirectly supports these operations by protecting them. So they they protect them, protect manufacturing firms from competing and conflicting uses. Uh, at the same time, there's a couple of trade offs or challenges here. There's a, a very low supply of land where a lot of our interviewees want to locate. And in some cases, Regulations vary by council, and in some cases they're weak, and this allows non-industrial uses into the area, which bids up the rents, and we see these typical industrial gentrification processes uh, occurring in, in a number of the sites. The other thing, um, and I think there's a great quote on the next slide, is sort of that some, some firms want the protection, but they don't necessarily fit within that tight control around use separation and amenity impact because a lot of these hybrid firms are blending different facets of production and consumption on site. So they don't really f necessarily fit with the traditional industrial zone, you know, do, which is doing its job, 
Um, but and, and they feel kind of stuck in between because commercial zones or those that have more of a mix, they still have an amenity impact there and they're quite costly as well. So they can't always afford to locate in those areas. Um, another interesting thing is around permitting that um, probably something we can go into afterwards more, but the, the Victorian planning provisions process is very much on use separation and amenity impact. It's not about sustainable production. Um, and so a number of firms reported what they felt was an imbalance or a bias towards existing use. Um, so if you introduce a new changing use, whether it's a manufacturing firm that wants to have a consumption space on site, it's adding office, putting solar on your roof, you have to go through a, a permit process. And what happens is on the other end, you have existing uses continue on site, say it's an auto repair shop or fiberglass manufacturing, something like this that might be potentially noxious, unsustainable use. They can go through the planning system more smoothly than these new uses that our system hasn't really quite uh, adapted to or, or fully understood. And, and so it has that potential to inadvertently discount potential sustainability while potentially supporting more noxious uses. Um, the other thing that firms ran up against is varying council requirements, particularly around um, obtaining permits. Uh, so there's a lot of local discretion, a lot of variation planner knowledge. When firms were going through a planning process with a knowledgeable planner, they reported very great outcomes. Other times, um, a lot of risk and uncertainty and high cost was introduced because they're paying rent during what can be a delayed permitting process. Um, and this is particularly the case for untested or uncodified uses, fairly new uses, distilleries or something that came up a lot uh, in, in this um, situation. So just summing up quickly, industrial land provides this indirect sustainability resource or at least to support the potential for um, small scale sustainable production. But we have challenges around land supply and rent pressures where we need this land. Uh, and a lot of the questions around amenity impact and use separation are not necessarily appropriate for the way that a lot of the manufacturers that are in an urban location um, do business, but nonetheless um, still provides that, that protection function, which is important. So there's room to talk about ways the planning system can go through some changes in terms of variation discretion, thinking about educating firms in the planning process and planners in the business process to adapt to this changing manufacturing in our cities. Thanks a lot. There's a holding slide, Carl. OK. OK. So I didn't, can, I didn't want it to go blank. Can I ask uh, Joe, Jessica, and Carl to sit on the, this whole discussion before about whether to sit here or over there? Do you want to sit in front of it now? Um, we'll try here. The light. Yeah, or if, if you, you advance the, the slide light, one, it'll go yeah, blank. OK, we'll lose the light. Just while I've got that up there, though, if you are interested in being interviewed talking about this research, then that's our contact details there or we'll, we'll have other ways of staying in touch. But I'm going to turn this off so that we don't get blind, blinded by the light. Um, <laughs> so we actually have quite a long time for discussion. Hopefully you're interested in that. Otherwise, we're going to um, <laughs> Go to, go to the pub next door for a drink. <laughs> Oxford Scholar, you're welcome to join us. It is not a hybrid operation, is it? No. Don't, don't manufacture be at brew well, pubs. It, it's hybrid in that it's owned by the university, so it's university spaces plus a pub. So yeah, know, that's a, not, another not, sort of different kind of hybrid yeah, different possibility of hybrid. here. Um, so I'm going to open up uh, to questions shortly, and we've got some online questions. You, you look doubtful. Is that the look? Of, okay, good. We've got two there. But just to begin with the obvious question I'm going to ask Jessica, um, having seen our work and been here for a week or whatever, is there anything that Melbourne should definitely learn from London or vice versa <laughs> in terms of industrial land planning? I mean, I think it's what's so interesting is the you know realization that every every place really is so different, um, and seeing the scale of the kind of suburban sprawling context in Melbourne just I think makes it very very different to London um, so I don't, I don't know the extent to which 
the the land pressures that we're experiencing in London, the really acute land pressures are going to be felt here in the same way. Um, but I would have thought it, they might be felt on pockets. Where it's boundary again. Yeah, yeah, but I think that, you know, if we think about, um, as Carl was alluding to there, the the fact that, that you know, there are businesses who, who do want and need to be in a particular location. So there will be pockets of uh, land, I would have thought, within Melbourne where the pressures are high um, and and particularly I think the last mile distribution um, demand might affect those th those types of businesses so I think I think there are things that that, that are worth kind of thinking about uh, but the scale is very different here you know I was amazed at the amount of industrial land Melbourne has actually in comparison yeah I feel like some of the lessons that we can draw are more relate geographically specific mm. to some extent. Like when you see Carl's photos of what industrial parks look like on the on the urban fringe of Melbourne, that is a very different form um, and use, and the pressures are different. Sydney might be more comparable to London perhaps because it is more tightly bounded. But mm. then when you get down to particular kinds of um, businesses and firms and their kind of space requirements, even utilities, let alone their consumers and supply chains, all that kind of stuff. It is really comparable. There just isn't. The and I think the vacancy rate, you can speak to that, Carl, can you? In in a, in a Melbourne is much lower. I don't have exact numbers oh, right. for you, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I was purposely trying to show that because I want to give a different picture on what industrial land is. Obviously, you know, the outer suburban areas matter and that's important as well, but it's just different. Yeah. Um, and I'm just struck also by that question of employment density as well. That's a question here. I mean, it depends whether we're thinking about planning for the city and the city's needs and their need to have their meal delivered in two hours and the maximum amount of stuff from Amazon. That's one way of looking at it. And that's a kind of land driven consideration. And then there's thinking about employment and who works and what the nature of their employment is. So they're sort of they're bound up, but they're not always the equivalent, I think. In, that, that plays up there. Um, Hugh, could you, um, do you want to read one of the online questions? I'd be happy to, yes, and that's all working. Um, so it starts very nicely. Thanks, Jessica. Great presentation. Uh, are the older, smaller established industrial areas in London transitioning in terms of type of industry, use of tech, attracting new industries, uh, development of clusters, etc., or are they just stagnating, declining? Oh, um, yeah, I, th I think the answer is, you know, changing all the time. Um, so, you know, it was the question about inner, inner London. Older, so. The older, yeah, yeah, the, the kind of the older Victorian manufacturing ring, for example, around um, the city fringe, uh, you know, has seen several waves of change uh, over the years. And, um, and there's been the, the expansion of the financial district as well, so the pressures associated with that, as, as well as kind of the loft conversions and residential. Um, but it's still a very vibrant uh, commercial district, but I think more akin to the, the, the types of district that, that uh, Carl was talking about the, that have transitioned to more broadly commercial, but still have some industrial uses in, in there. I'm not sure if that answers the I question. I think that does answer the question. Um, whoever wrote that one, uh, Tony, I think uh, if you have a follow up, please follow up. Um, I've got some more if you want. Or go Let's go to the room here and I'll bring the microphone to you, I think. Do we have questions in here? All concerned? Yes. OK, one, two, three. I'm going to go. Your face is familiar, but I can't remember who you are. So. <laughs> <laughs> please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Mark Woodland from Echelon Planning. Um, <laughs> my question, I've thank you, Jess, for your presentation. Um, your work was quite an inspiration for me over the last few years um, in understanding some of the dynamics in London and thinking about whether or not we might find ourselves dealing with some of those same issues in inner Melbourne in, in the near future. So thank you for all your hard work over the last few years. Um, the London policies around intensification and mixed use. Um, I'm really interested to understand each of those. Uh, so in relation to intensification, is that a real thing that's being market driven or is it just an idea that effectively enables land to be shrunk and repurposed? And then secondly, with mixed use, I've seen some really interesting development approvals coming out of London for things like 
apartments above cement factories and hardware the hardware yards timber yards and all sorts of things where you might naturally think there's an incompatibility of use i don't know whether they get built or not but that idea of mixed use and its viability if you could maybe speak to those two questions of whether the policy is real or is it just yep ideas? so um it's a really good question the the policies on intensification co-location very much the idea was that if we you know create this policy policy context hopefully the market will respond um so there wasn't much evidence of uh, an appetite for uh, intensification of industrial. Um, I think the idea was that if we, you know, if we lose enough land, then, you know, we'll just force a situation where people have to do it differently. Um, but, you know, as, as I kind of hinted at, the, the, yeah, look, the, the public sector is having to take a little bit of a lead in terms of, you know, showing what can be done. Um, but it does seem, I mean, it seems as though we're now at the point where there are many mixed use schemes in the pipeline that uh, architects and others can't necessarily talk very openly about yet. Um, but within five years, I would have thought there will be a lot of examples there that we can draw on. Um, so one of, you know, something that I've got in my mind is, you know, is anybody actually going to be evaluating uh, the outcomes of these schemes and you know that's like, I, think, I think that's an area for research and would be, would be of interest to other places. Mm. Was it you? Yes, okay. Was it Andrew? Did you have a question? No, someone else. Forget. Hi, um, I'm Michelle from the EPA. So my question is just in regards uh, for Jessica, in regards to the co-location of residential in the industrial area, how are they dealing with historical land contamination from the previous industrial activities on the sites? Mm. Thank you for your excellent data. Yes. <laughs> Yay, EPA. Um, it's a really good question and I don't I, I don't have an immediate answer to it. I think, you know, in, in this, it's not a new, the, the policy on co-location is not creating a new situation in a sense because we've, we've, we've had policies of, you know, residential and mixed use development on industrial land for a while. What's new about it is trying to make sure that we keep the industrial floor space in, in that mix. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the questions around contamination and, and how to deal with it, something planners that we have been dealing with for a long time, we know it's expensive. Um, and this is why, you know, viability of some of these schemes is, is, is questioned um, and is, is difficult. But yeah, it's not, it's, in a sense, it's not a new challenge, I don't think, for planners. Yeah. Um, do, you, do we have another online question? Yes, we do. Um, we've got one here from Paul. Uh, I think it reads a little bit more a statement, but Carl, I'll let you turn it into the question you want to answer and then, uh, <laughs> and then answer that question. Um, doing some work on cultural industry startup uh, needs in the Gold Coast, there was a challenge faced by firms that started with production only, then some on-site retail and then some performance, especially around car park in old industrial estates. So I think that's about the creep of uses in industrial areas. Well, I'm latching onto the parking yeah, I'm thing, and I know Liz is probably that. chomping at the bit to get this in, but just say that was, I'll let you answer it if you want, but just that that was something that came up a lot around permitting was parking. It was a big thing in industrial land, so yeah. give you a chance. On parking, we're hoping to go back through all the interviews and, you know, extract the, the parking implications here, because as always, it's this kind of key um, conflict point. Uh, real or kind of anticipated. So yeah, for planning permits and any of these kind of hybrid uses, I don't know if it's the same in Queensland or whatever, but here triggering that change of use, adding um, retail, uh, any ma major works, these kinds of things, triggers a planning permit and that triggers the minimum parking requirements. And we can see in the interviews already, there's a lot of kind of tension around the requirement um, for parking provision for industry is based on square meterage and then for cafes and shops is, is a different kind of calculation based on expected customers and that means you have to do a, a traffic assessment usually. Some of the businesses aren't really in a position to do this or they find it quite intimidating or they're risk averse around it 
Often that means you have to provide more parking than they could possibly provide or they can't do the um, retailing. And we also heard stuff around um, things like something I've been interested in for a while is the parking requirements seem to have started from that picture like Joe had of the, the suburban lot that had the car park and then the factory, you know, like you had 100 workers in, in this building, but now with much lower employment density, you don't necessarily use that much employee parking. It's more about visitors and uh, trucks and things like that. So are they out of sync? Where is it the, and then you have a lot of parking you won't necessarily need. At the other extreme, uh, yeah. lots of complaints about um, <laughs> the existing, you know, um, smaller car repair places who seem to always take all their customers' cars and park them all along the street and move them every two hours. And that seems to be like, well, more to come on parking. But it is this, I think uh, the publication that's hopefully coming out on this, we try to tackle this question around the processes and, and, and kind of hurdles you jump if you're doing something new or slightly changing, or as the question speaks to, adding a, a different part of your business operation and how that triggers all these things that uh, have a planning intention and purpose, but they do fall unevenly on new businesses and um, what are the kind of trade-offs there? And that's something we're still, Joe and I in particular, are kind of like, how do you? It's a good, I mean, it's a good litmus test for looking at the hybrid firms because they're not quite manufacturing. They're definitely not just consumption. What's, you know, what's that requirement there? And I think maybe in introducing creative industries there that you could have create cultural manufacturing with a consumption element that it introduces this. And like just building on one of the things that Liz was talking about is we had one guy complaining about his parking requirements that, um, you know, too many parking spaces for the site. But then he was also, you know, there's this older, smaller firm, which he was complaining about getting trucks through because all the employees would park off site mm -hmm. um, and block the truck, you know. So there's this balance in how that requirement actually works that is not finessed between new and, and established uses. And just add one dimension, I think that I think Paul raises an interesting point, particularly with respect to these kind of hybrid businesses around the kind of temporal nature of that business development model that might be a little different to what accepted norms of establishing business in industrial zones is, you know, that there's a some of these businesses not really necessarily planning for the hybrid, you know, commercial consumer focused area, but gr growing to, an, to a point where they, they realise that's going to be a you know, a lot of opportunity for business growth and then coming back up against the planning system that they've already navigated, but with a very different set of needs. A question here. Paul Rankin's my name. Is that on? Yeah. Uh, I work in property development and uh, live pretty close to um, the, the Montague precinct, uh, which is South Melbourne. And, uh, an evolving area but, and a fascinating area, but uh, my question, which is also a bit of a statement, goes to the idea of co-location or adjacency of uses. So that part of South Melbourne uh, has an incredible um, variety, and has had an incredible variety of different uses. Uh, metal worker, um, printer, uh, glass factory, um, car mechanics, plenty of them. Um, but uh, it does create a, an incredibly rich neighbourhood. Uh, where you could, could literally get almost anything done uh, within walking distance. It was, it's, it's quite absurd when I think of like businesses I've had, like, oh, where can I get some business cards printed? I oh, was just around the corner. <laughs> so, um, there is a downside to it though, and, um, I, and I suppose, uh, Carly, you talked about the uh, potential conflict you get with rezoning uh, and entrepreneurial businesses, which are you know, land uses, well, it's not permanent, but uh, you know, the, the time frame, it's quite different, whereas uh, starting up a business is it's a temporary uh, thing. But I'm also thinking of uh, some of the other challenges like um, noise, uh, very hard to measure and police. And um, the one that doesn't get talked about much is um, smell. Uh, I ride a bike around Fishman's Bend a lot. And I got to tell you, sometimes the, um, it's, it's, <laughs> I always wish I was wearing a mask. It's not, it's, it's, uh, it's not good. Um, so yeah, there's these sorts of problems and I'm interested to know if there's any sort of um, contemporary thinking about how to grapple with those because I, uh, as, as appealing as uh, the idea of co-location seems to me and I'm very interested to see how some of these examples in 
uh, London uh, unfold over the next few years, um, it does seem that there's, there's quite a few practical um, uh, challenges on a micro level. Thank you, Paul. Joe or Carl, want to speak to that one? Um, I mean, I'll just I just say like I, I really love your example because mm. in a lot of urban industrial zones that we've gone to, we experienced that they're almost like community service spaces that people don't really think about that. And I get I guess from my perspective, it's it's almost akin to earlier gentrification when you had residents coming into CBD and there's music venues that res they're complaining about why well, I didn't know it was going to be noisy down here. Um, and you know they're not comfortable with the apartment in that space. And we've kind of been, you know, from a creative industries perspective, that's been an issue going on for a long time. Um, and I, I guess I see sim similar outcomes. You have cities like Austin that appoint special live music commissions to deal with this um, issue. And I feel like zoning can be part of a way to mitigate it, but there's other factors in terms of community outreach and things to address it. But you're never going to have a perfect solution and that's not what a city's for I don't think anyway but lots of different mix in different places that can um, potentially support it and I, I guess I'm speaking from like a social and planning perspective and not from a property development perspective but just in a general sense I think I'd like to speak to sort of the historical and the with the things we just sort of talk about we haven't really resolved them but a lot of the zoning and the kind of what we call proto zoning stuff came out of smell so that term marvelous Melbourne was um, coined for a reason and some of that was the sewerage lack of and some of it was the noxious trades and the earliest health regulations and land use separations building codes and then zoning they were about smell and the way that industry worked in those kind of late 19th century early 20th century contexts was they, they were disgusting and and add to that dust um and what do we added noise, noise yeah. and then later on we're getting to sort of traffic as being a key aspect here light is the thing that comes up sort of that's a more added later so when you look at some of the newer uh, the data centers logistics centers sometimes what people really notice is that the lights are on 24 hours a day that kind of stuff mm -hmm. so there's always a kind of regulatory response to conflicting uses and the particular amenity things that come with it so they're well intentioned and then the kind of challenge is a little bit are new industries like that to some extent, but they're not as bad as they were. And then you have that sort of, that's reflected already in our categories of zoning. We have industrial three zones, industrial one, the heaviest categories, et cetera. But then you get in the sort of territory of like, you're trying to constantly reclassify. And, um, and then that leads to sort of pressures on land speculation as well, that this is a lesser industrial area. So then maybe this is suitable for a residential and so on. So haven't resolved it. There does seem to be a need, though, to kind of recognise that some of the industries, businesses, manufacturing, whatever the word we use, that really need to be in the city and really could fit your description of it, of what is effectively that 20 minute neighbourhood aspiration, that they can't fit there at the moment, partly for regulatory reasons, but they could and they're not as bad as they were. How you actually negotiate that in planning terms, I don't know, because it does open up all these other potential issues down down the road. But and I'd also say that there's a trade off. I've seen this in my research more about um, landfills in, in the past, but the more you kind of separate and kind of focus on the amenity issues, which are real, the bigger the thing that you're trying to control gets. So chicken farms, for example, they were zoned out in the sense of the city throughout the 20th century because they smell a bit. And so you went from having five chickens in the yard to a uh, hundred chicken factory that oh we don't want that here that only belongs out there and now you've got so I'm looking at Andrea now two million chickens in a monster factory farm that can't be within you know five kilometers of anything else because it's such a noxious use so that there's that kind of scale thing comes out of that as well I want Joe's comments on this though, look you, I was, was going to come in but you've covered everything that I thought thought, thought to stay there I guess it's the it's the blood you know making sure we don't just accept the lowest common denominator in policy because it's too hard otherwise because I think you you know your your sort of statement nicely captured as Liz said this tension between the affordances of mix and the challenges of it so it, it would be sad for us to say well it was you know ideas of separating mix that come from early 20th century when we did di very different landscape of industry we're just going to stick with because noise dust light etc is to the detriment of 
a sustainable city, of livable city, of prosperous, you know, rich employment city, um, and we can do better at that. Big, big hand up over there. Someone is. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Over to you. Uh, Peter Elliott, former state government. Um, so I've sort of worked in the industrial planning area for quite some time. And I think the work that um, and this seminar is actually really um, uh, an important um, uh, way of thinking about industrial land because what I see is that there are many commonalities between cities and I see London as being where we will be in 25 years time. Um, once uh, we actually um, start to see greater development within metropolitan Melbourne as the growth areas start to, to um, slow down or start to diminish. Um, the wave of residential will start to go into the inner part of Melbourne and the pressure on industrial land will increase. At the moment, we have incredible controls over industrial land, very different to London. Um, we have some really significant controls on most of our industrial land. Um, and so, but governments change very much like, you know, death and taxes, governments do change as well and they change their minds often quickly. Um, but one of the things that I was thinking about with um, London is um, there's what 8,000 hectares, 7,000 hectares of industrial land. What I'm thinking is where is that land being substituted? Is it being substitute, substituted elsewhere? So not more like the sort of like network economy, it's actually outside of London because London is so incredibly expensive. Um, whereas um, uh, you've actually got some, some sort of uses in there that sort of need to be in there. And it's one of the things that um, me as a former policymaker, and there's probably some policymakers in the audience, that we have to re um, prosecute the case for industrial development and industrial land over and over again as it changes because it goes through feds, it goes through times when it's the most important thing in the world to when it's oh, the industrialization, we get rid of it all. Um, so um, I think that's the, the re-prosecution, but I'm interested in your comments about um, sort of networking uh, land. Sh shall I respond? Um, yeah. So my answer to the, the, the substitution question is I don't think this is really being achieved at all. Um, it's an aspiration. Um, uh, the problem we have in London is, is the governance and the fact that, you know, the, the part of London that falls within the Greater London Authority boundary uh, that the Mayor of London has control over is not the functional economic area. Um, so the functional economic area extends, you know, is far wider. Um, so the mayor does have a, a system of working with the home county local authorities around, but that's my understanding is that's quite fraught. Uh, lots of tensions there. Um, they don't want to be a dumping ground for all of London's industrial. Um, they've got their own aspirations for what they want to be. They don't. They also don't really want to be a dumping ground for London's housing. They don't really want to be a dumping ground at all. Um, so a lot of pushback. Um, so, so where that, so, so the, the big question mark and the, the, the debate that's now being pushed and opened up is around the green belt. Um, because successive mayors have not um, dared touch the green belt and open that conversation because it's like political suicide. Um, but Th there's quite a lot of push for that conversation to be opened because where else can we can we look for land essentially yeah it's not political suicide here it seems to be the yeah no it's fine yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can always move a bit further out um, <laughs> do we have other questions in the room or do we have online comments yeah this over here this side of it. Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, it's it's a similar question to the co-location one, but maybe on the flip side, so not co-locating within industrial areas, but is there potential, do you think, for lighter industrial uses to occur in non-industrial areas, so effectively a pressure outlet, um, particularly as land rents get higher in industrial areas, um, and how would that work? So maybe like a performance-based amenity um, approach or something like that? Is, is that something that occurs or do you think there's a scope for that? London or Melbourne or just right. in? Both. Okay. I'll just quickly say something on that, which is that um, there are some people pushing for a conversation um, around high streets, for example. Um, the fact that, so, so London has some very, very long high streets. Uh, 
of varying quality, but they're still they're still quite vibrant, even though retail has been in decline. But um, you know, the question is, can we accommodate some of the industrial uses within high streets? Can we think about areas that have not been industrial uh, industrially zoned or you know identified as industrial previously, and start thinking about the city as a, you know more broadly as a canvas for accommodating industrial where, whenever we can. So why not whenever a site comes up? For redevelopment, why not consider industrial as part of the mix? So that that, but we haven't really got there yet uh, in terms of the London plan thinking. But I think that I think that conversation will will emerge. I I think historically, you know, if we think about after the structural shifts in the 1970s, some of the planning responses in Melbourne were trying to do that, but then they're sort of watered down by I guess the land market questions, but then they change. So if you we've looked at some of the um, planning documents from the early 80s, um, where that was that kind of response to the de decline of the largest manufacturing sectors. And the idea of mixed use was initially kind of that um, and or at least a sort of a concept that industry could be co-located. I guess I'm muddling up your point a bit, but there was initially that sense that certain industries can mix and that was an amenity threshold. We have in our planning system, you have a list of uses that are um, have to have buffer zones and things like that and others that don't and that can be near other uses, but it has shaped, my sense has been shaped for a long time by the fact that industry or industrial land uses have a fairly low, what's the word? They can't pay as much rent. You know, they, they don't, they're not as competitive, but I mean, that but, might change. Yeah, um, well, I was just gonna say in the high street context that Jessica's talking about, the other challenge is just like, the con space configuration, like ceiling heights and mm. walls, loading docks and things like that, they're often not in place, so it's tough to do. And I just like anecdotally, ex an example from San Francisco is Proposition X, which said any if you tear down any industrial space, you got to rebuild it somewhere else in the city. Developers, I guess the fear was that that it, you know, it's still playing out. The space that would get built wouldn't work for anything but like an art gallery because mm. no manufacturer would be able to take up the space. Mm. Um, and so SF Made, which is like the big manufacturing advocacy group, was actually arguing against public uh, Proposition X for that reason. And, mm. But I feel like looking at history is an interesting way to do it because you do have, I mean, like the Sands and McDougall records that the stuff Joe was presenting on is based off of, you know, having the time to really dig into the type of outfits that are in these kind of locations would be worthwhile to see how that makes worse to look at what older building configurations work and didn't. Yeah, and, I, and that also overlaps with the Jessica's point about trying to retain the diversity of some of those early the workspaces that are existing. We don't generally, I mean, I'm broad brushing here, don't generally build them like that now. Um, and they are, there is a kind of benefit looking historically at, at those building footprints like the classic warehouse type ones and how they can be adapted and you know, learning from that in terms of how you think for the future, because our default for a long time seems to have been the mixed uses to have the ground floor, retail, IGA, food works. <laughs> trying to think of the other classic thing they have in their vaping store and then <laughs> apartments above. And we have, I mean, through looking at examples uh, from continental Europe and elsewhere, and also in design studios at Monash, we've tried to sort of think through what if you know even our standard development model was a bit more, if not specifically industrial, and at least adaptable to industrial, um, the ceilings and the loading areas and things like that. And then thinking about even the set, the ceilings being sort of loaded so that the noise and vibrations aren't as an issue as much of an issue if they do get taken up by that kind of stuff. So that it's a, a good provocation, I think. Um, and it might become more of an issue as the land value goes up. Hugh. So I do have uh, a few more questions, but I'm looking at the time. We've got time for one. Why not, yeah, why not get through all of them? Um, we want one for Joe, I think. Joe hasn't spoken. Oh, okay. This one okay. could be, it, well, it's got a little bit of London. It's got a little bit of Melbourne. Um, this question might be more relevant for London. I think there is a Melbourne aspect there. Uh, in light of the hyper-competitive industrial land use market, are there efforts to integrate employment, or social work, uh, socioeconomic impacts as a performative measure in planning applications or the development process? So if this is relevant to Melbourne, please discuss. So, uh, it's a, I mean, it's a really good question. I think um, you know, yet for planning, you know, jobs has always been a, a big question. 
um, and priority. So the concern that planners have at the moment around you know, data centres, very low, low job density, um, logistics currently have OK job density because there are still a lot of people working in those jobs. But the fear is that, you know, robotization will, will, will take over in that in that sector first. Um, so job densities are likely to drop. Um, and and that is a real concern um, at the same time. You know, if we're only ever thinking about jobs and, and job density, then we're kind of forgetting about the other infrastructure requirements, the fact that land needs to be used for other things apart from just accommodating jobs sometimes. Um, I don't know if you. Well, I think what's coming out in the interviews and particularly what Carl spoke to there is, I guess, less direct than the creation of jobs is the making sure that the policy settings don't systematically shut down diversity and makes, you know, an easier pathway for certain narrow uses like big data centres and, mm. and warehousing, as opposed to the whole range of diversity of manufacturing and production that currently use and will emerge in the future to use those spaces. <laughs> yeah, look, that's in the mix. And kids play gyms. Yeah. And this does seem, um, Andrew's referring to non industrial uses, industrial zones, big theme, and it's partly driven by zoning and partly by land, the way land's developed. You know, there's not many places to start an axe throwing <laughs> workshop, <laughs> <laughs> zoning and real estate wise, so they are in there. Um, and I think it's, a, we could wrap up on this note, right? I think, yes, I'll, more or less. Um, this is another one where we can sort of at least reflect on lessons from history um, and thinking about the opportunities for business startups and the sort of longevity of different kinds of sectors. It's hard to really lock in what employment looks like and, and um, plan for the future in that way. But I'd like to sort of throw back to say the Ruth and Murray Crow plan for Melbourne in the 1970s, which is available through the Victoria University archives. And they were proposing pretty much what we're talking about now. So there's a lot of progressive ideas in the past about maintaining kind of flexible workspaces that are main, sort of more secure, ongoing employment that has equity as its core consideration, not just the, the latest fad and, and the latest big speaker, which might be Amazon or whoever it is now. So how you actually translate that in, uh, into practice is the challenge. And I felt like I had another, it's not car parking. I'm trying to edge that one. <laughs> it's definitely something else. Um, no, I can't remember. So I think we might be at the, the end of the seminar. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers again for time and Hugh and uh, Ivy. <laughs> thank you, Ivy. <laughs> Still can't chase that thought away. I had another comment. Um, but yeah, get in touch if you'd like to sort of let us know what we got wrong or right or what we should be looking at and what the latest uh, industrial conflicts are. Um, oh, sorry, that was my joke. It was going to be about jobs, jobs and growth. It's all about jobs and growth in Melbourne, but it's always the housing industry and construction and apologies to the suburban rail authority here. It's like we need to do this in part because it'll create jobs for like five years while we build all this stuff. So if we could kind of leverage that political and broader fascination with jobs and combine it with a more nuanced understanding of what employment looks like now, could look like, and what, what we want to have it in our cities, not just in building houses, it would be the sort of, you know, Mark, you want to add? I was going to ask you to tell us about your music factory ordinance. Ah, oh, the music, yes, my favourite post, uh, songs about factories closing down. I think life in a northern town comes out on top, if those who haven't touched on it. Um, <laughs> it's it, The film clip is actually, it's somewhere in um, uh, northern um, New York State, I think, but it sort of seems to be referring to Manchester and others. But there's some, um, I think in a way, I had a list here. Didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> For the <laughs> pump <pump -back>. Yes. <laughs> Well, music, like I said, I'd come back to it. You know, music, because often music, the best music scenes come out of, have come out of, suddenly having um, not as many employment opportunities and a lot of space. That's what the research says. It's a, a terrible situation in a way, but, you know, UB40 is, you know, unemployment benefit band. Um, 
or even the specials, ghost town. This town is coming like a ghost town, but that means they have there's a lot of places to have music venues. And this, of course, is the precursor to gentrification. A lot of the time is that when you bring in the music, but rehearsal spaces, live music performances, and and Melbourne's kind of heyday of live music, so to speak, was during that period of um, scaling down of uh, traditional employment and a lot of the inner city was more um, storage warehousing places mm -hmm. and that's where these venues were and now of course the sort of pressure is on again but the, it does sort of capture that um, sense of uh, I guess being caught up in change this is I think the broader you know esoteric theme about planning for industry is that you're trying to make a place survive the, the changing fortunes of the, the global economy and that kind of experience of, of music in cities captures people move there for a job and the job, generally speaking, what it lasts 10 years, 20 years. I'm going to reference Billy Joel and lose all credibility, but <laughs> Alan Town, you know, he actually specifically wrote that song about steel towns in Pennsylvania and how people move there with a sense of op optimism about having a job and a town that they believed in and then the factories close and they move away. So that's, yeah. If you prepare to listen to Billy Joel, that's that's one to point to. Thank you. Liz. Any others? In parks? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh, in drains. Yes, that's another one. I feel like it, it says something about real estate, or and also it happens online and in garage. Yeah. I don't think that it's necessarily it's tied up with alcohol anymore. But that a, a wonderful discussion for another day. I think that music is no longer necessarily commercialized. Um, it happens in liminal spaces. Um, I don't think there's music at the Oxford School. They're probably not allowed to, if we look at their liquor license, it probably says they're not allowed to have um, alcohol. But we will wrap it up. And if you want to join us for a drink next door, you're more than welcome to or get in touch. And thank you for your attendance. Have I forgotten something, Joe and Carl and Jessica? Sorry. No. Sorry. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>